Welcome everyone to our SIRMA webinar. Today we are talking about sports and entertainment business interruption claims. We've got an all-star panel of professionals in this field. So we're all really lucky to hear from some of the foremost experts really in the world in these subjects. Uh, I will give you a quick intro to our organization, what we're doing, why we're here, and then we're gonna get right into our discussion. So our presenters are Jason Bernstein. Jason is VP and Assistant General mm -hmm. Counsel for AEG Presents. He provides guidance and counseling to producers and promoters of some of the world's foremost concerts, musical festivals, tours, and live events. As I mentioned, he's senior counsel for AEG Presents. He's involved in all aspects of touring and live events. Jason, welcome. Jason is also uh, a member of our advisory board here at CERMA, so we're very happy to have him. Next is Ryan Douglas. Ryan is with USI Insurance uh, Services. He is a 22-year veteran. Did I get that right, Ryan? Yes, sir. That's it. 22-year veteran of the sports and entertainment uh, practice. Him and his partner and colleague, Shalom Sanulia, who is uh, an advisory board member as well, and a very valued partner of CERMA, uh, are involved in USI's sports and entertainment practice. Uh, Ryan, as you can see, is VP of property and casualties. USI is a leading local and national insurance brokerage and consulting firm delivering customized property and casualty, employee benefits, personal risk, retirement solutions throughout the US. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. Next is Simon Kishishian. Simon is a man who needs no introduction anywhere in the civilized world. He is a valued member of the CERMA Advisory Board. In fact, board member number 1.5, maybe. Uh, one, 1 1.5, right. Uh, Simon is the Vice President of Risk Management and Risk Control at Red Bull. Um, he is involved in pretty much everything to do with uh, litigation, claims management, litigation management, risk finance, risk transfer, event safety, and loss control. Um, uh, Simon, thank you so much for joining us here today. Finally, we've got Michael Levine. Michael is a partner at Hunton Andrews Kurth LLP. Mike is a legal 500 and Chambers USA ranked lawyer with more than 25 years of experience litigating insurance disputes and advising clients on insurance coverage matters. Mike, so happy to have you on the webinar today. Thanks, Ruth. Before we get into our discussion, I want to tell you very quickly about our organization. So CERMA is the Sports and Entertainment Risk Management Alliance. Uh, I am the founder and CEO. I'm very uh, humbled and privileged to have such amazing people join me in addition to our advisory board members that you see in front of us today. We've got an incredible group of people who have been instrumental in starting this organization with us. And the reason we started, as our mission statement uh, indicates, is because those of us who practice in the sports and entertainment, risk, claims, legal, insurance world, um, found that there was a bit of a vacuum uh, in terms of an organization devoted to deal with the issues, provide uh, solutions, provide tips, networking, content in this specific area of the world. So uh, there's some other organizations providing great content around some of these issues, but there wasn't one clearinghouse. So that's what we as CERMA are trying, to, are trying to provide. One central area where you can get great content like you'll hear today, listen to some of our podcasts um, that you'll, we'll tell you about in a moment, uh, attend some of our in-person events that we'll tell you about. Our first major in-person event will be in October in Philadelphia. Um, and basically provide a community of professionals in this industry to share best practices, network, and learn from each other. So um, we've been around a few months, and you can learn more about our organization at thecerma.org. There you will see some of our content, including the Serma Pod, which is our podcast. Uh, we have put forth uh, four podcasts so far. In fact, we now have five. We taped our uh, fifth one yesterday and we aim to have these podcasts deal with issues that are happening right now in the sports and entertainment world so you see that we've done issues dealing with 
What's the exposure for the Will Smith flap? Lessons from the Johnny Depp trial. Uh, COVID claims related to sports and entertainment. Name, image, and licensing issues in the NCAA. We're doing one on Monday on a lawsuit filed by a Jacksonville Jaguars punter against uh, his employer alleging a hostile work environment. Uh, we're going to do one probably in another week or so about a fan who punched another fan at the Rangers game and who just got arrested. So one of the reasons we put Sermon together was because these issues are out there every single day, right? We all follow these issues in sports and entertainment. There's usually a legal insurance risk um, claims issue. We're going to cover those. We're very excited to do so. Please tune in. You can find the Surma pod and all of our content at our website, thesurma.org, um, and on all social media. So with that being said, we're going to jump into our topic today. Our topic today deals with business interruption claims. You couldn't find a more timely topic these days than business interruption claims, specifically how they affect the sports and entertainment world. Um, anything from, we'll be dealing with things like COVID, like weather related issues, like cyber risks. Um, we're all coming out of, of course, one of the most historic uh, business interruption issues of all time in COVID. How do sports and entertainment, uh, how, how do those professions deal with it? You're gonna hear from our panel on, uh, on that particular topic. We're gonna jump into it in a moment. We'd like you to take our survey at the end of today's webinar. Uh, we're very much interested in what our audience wants to hear in future presentations. We are basing our content partially on that. So please take a moment, fill that out. We'd love to hear from you what you liked, what you didn't like. <laughs> Lastly, we'd love to hear your feedback during today's webinar. We're gonna go uh, for another 52 minutes approximately. We're gonna get you out of here at noon central, uh, but we'd love to hear from you if you've got questions please type them in or comments, please type them into the box and we will get to all of our questions before the end of the webinar. With that being said, let's jump into our topic. Um, Simon, uh, we, we talked about it a little bit, but maybe you wanna give an, an overview of what the primary risks that interrupt business are in the space that we're dealing with, particularly sports and entertainment. Yeah, so really quickly before I go too deep in the woods, I just thought I'd focus on what exactly a business interruption is. Uh, essentially, it's defined as lost business and income stemming from disruptions to business operations. Historically, when I think about that, I think about hurricanes, fires, floods, earthquakes, and you know, sort of the lost business that comes um, from that or that sort of grows from that. Uh, but as you've mentioned, some of the last couple of years have, uh, have shown all of us that there's a whole lot more to it. And as people have been more sophisticated with computer um, ransomware and, and the like, we're now seeing things like, you know, that weren't traditional, like hurricanes and fires, but um, people disrupting business by uh, overtaking their computer systems. Or uh, as we all know, unless you've been under a rock, uh, the last couple of years, uh, operations, standard operating procedure for, for, uh, for all of us has been difficult because of the pandemic. Um, so how do we deal with this? Well, you know, I look at this from a risk management perspective. And when I look at the sort of what the three pillars of risk management are and what the three tenants are, there's three things that 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 come to mind. And and as a general rule, what you look for from a risk management perspective uh, and try to identify risks and how to deal with them is you, you, you look at risk avoidance, you look at risk finance, and you look at risk transfer. Uh, risk avoidance is pretty pretty simple. It's you don't do the activity. Uh, you shut down the arena, you close the offices, you tell people to go home, you sit on your hands and you hope for the best. Unfortunately, as we all are running businesses and uh, most of them are for profit, although some days are better than others, um, you really can't do that. And you can't uh, operate a business without risk, there's no growth. And so part of the role of a risk manager is to allow the business to do whatever it has to do and, and to try to mitigate the loss or take prophylactic measures to try to avoid that. And so, you know, that could be something as simple as having rules in place on how to deal with COVID. It could be things like, um, for example, keeping people six feet apart, doing temperature checks as people enter into a stadium, um, seating people 
at a distance, requiring face masks, identifying um, you know the frequency of people having um, COVID exposure and notifying folks and 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 so on. So there's a lot of different things you can do. The other thing is kind of simple. Uh, we call it risk finance, but it's basically buying an insurance policy or if you've got the capability or the financial wherewithal to taking on self-insurance or setting up a captive. And most businesses carry commercial property insurance at some level. They also carry general liability insurance. And I'll turn to Ryan shortly to sort of identify some of the benefits and some of the um, some of the issues that we've seen, uh, especially with respect to COVID and cyber and so on and so forth. Uh, but there are insurance policies that we we that we identify and utilize in order to sort of avoid bankrupting a company. Uh, and those are sort of under the title of risk finance, which I won't go into detail at the moment, but but I can certainly speak to shortly. The next thing is then risk transfer. And what's risk transfer from a risk manager's perspective? It's seeking to minimize or exculpate yourself from requiring uh, from from risk. And that could be done by a number of different things. There's not a lot of stadiums anybody's entered over the last years where you didn't have some sort of a waiver, maybe on the back of the ticket. You haven't been um, contracting with any entities that don't have some sort of indemnification or risk transfer devices built into the contracts where, where you're requiring the people that are sort of, um, that give rise to the instrumentality of risk to take on the res responsibility and have indemnity and insurance to back it up. So those are the three things risk transfer, uh, risk finance, and risk avoidance. And I think when you sort of look at the big picture, whether it's COVID or whether it's cyber liability, from a big picture perspective, it's being prepared, working to prevent, and then detecting when things do happen, remediating and addressing those, and then making efforts to recover. And so that's sort of a big picture overview from a risk manager's perspective. Um, and again, we're talking today primarily about um, business interruption and and most likely with COVID that we've all seen, natural disasters, ransomware, and potentially labor strikes. So so that's sort of it in a nutshell from uh, from sort of an introductory perspective. Yeah, thank you, Simon. That's a great intro. So why don't we just jump into you know a specific topic, that being COVID, and we'll let's get everyone's perspective on maybe how those three factors that you talked about relate to COVID claims because, you know, we're all dealing with those in some respect or another. Um, uh, Michael, do you want to talk maybe about a little bit of an overview of how these claims have developed over the last couple of years, what they look like, and then we'll talk about those three different points that Simon Simon discussed. Yeah, sure. Um, and and COVID probably is the, the most current and relevant um, springboard for this conversation, although it's certainly not uh, the only uh, factor Simon mentioned. There are many uh, causes of loss that would lead to an interruption of a sports or entertainment operation or any operation for that matter. But with respect to COVID, it, it, it has very much been an evolving um, situation from an insurance perspective, from a risk management perspective, and from a legal perspective. Um, if we take ourselves back in time to January and February of 2020, March of 2020, when COVID was first emerging, um, it, it, it was very different. If, if you can remember how we were treating our packages, our groceries, where we were literally wiping things down on our doorstep and isolating them before bringing them into our house. Um, that was the perception and mindset that we as a society had as COVID was taking over the country and the world. Things have changed and we are now dealing with a very different situation. And that's important because from a business interruption standpoint for the billions of dollars of loss that have occurred since the early months of 2020, we have to put ourselves back to that original mindset to understand why these losses were covered, are covered, under traditional uh, business interruption insurance products. Um, the evolution, uh, the education of what COVID is, how it affects property, and ultimately how that relates to business interruption has changed markedly. At the very outset, there was a lot of talk about government orders and government imposed regulations on business. And the early lawsuits and claims that were brought with respect to COVID focused primarily on government regulation and government orders. Now, 
we have since learned that the impetus for those regulations and orders was in fact the hazard and the danger from the presence of COVID both on surfaces and in the air. We have learned over the course of two years that many businesses, many sports venues, um, canceled or restricted their operations because of the perceived danger, regardless of any government regulation or order. And the, the cause of the interruption matters. And we'll talk about this uh, as we start to get into the different insurance products, but the cause is critical because insurance policies, um, as well as contractual risk transfer vehicles, are tied specifically to the cause of loss. And while one cause may be covered or trigger an indemnity obligation, another cause may not. And understanding what that cause is that's res resulted in your interruption, therefore, is, is fundamentally critical. Um, going back to the beginning of the pandemic, certain claims were made, lawsuits were brought alleging a certain cause. Through the education about COVID and learning how it was affecting us, those causes have changed. So when we look at what's happened to date in terms of coverage for business interruption resulting from the pandemic and from COVID-19, there has been a very wide um, array of decisions. And they have, you know, they, some have favored insurance carriers. Just yesterday, an appellate court in Louisiana found that the claims should be covered, that the policy language is in fact ambiguous when relating to the presence of a virus or a pandemic such as COVID-19. So it, there's a lot going on um, and we will dive into the, the specific issues, but to, to sum it all up, you know, in, in even a one hour webinar um, is gonna leave us woefully short. There's that much happening and it's changing on a daily basis. For sure. So let's get you just to comment on this, Michael, and then we'll get Ryan on the same subject. Just explain again, you could talk for hours about the subject, but in a quick way, how how that evolution look, right? What the claims were when they first came in as they relate to sports and entertainment, what the reaction of the carriers were, and then how the courts have interpreted some of uh, the reactions. Yeah, so those early claims, like I said, were based um, primarily on government restrictions. Government came in, said, um, if you're a non-essential business, and that would include most sports and entertainment venues, then you either could not operate or had to operate at a very severe restriction um, to the point that it would not have been economically viable to continue to operate. Um, over time, again, the evolution has changed where the dangers were better understood, the transmission mechanisms and vehicles were better understood. And even though government regulations were lifted, many operations continued to either be closed or substantially reduced because of the, the danger and the inability to manage it from a risk perspective in a safe manner. And many companies, uh, many that we're representing and many others that are uh, out there still pursuing claims had their own internal controls and protocols in place that were far more restrictive than any government regulation. And that was because of the damage and the danger that was being posed by the presence of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which causes COVID-19. The courts, again, have focused, some have, and I'm not gonna lump them all together because courts have done very odd things in the, in the sphere of COVID-19 um, business interruption litigation, but those that have dug in and analyzed the facts and the allegations and the policy wording have started to understand a critical difference between a cause of loss caused by a government regulation or order versus a cause of loss caused by damage to, again, either the indoor air, the surfaces, or the inability to safely utilize the insured business. And, and just to quickly bring it back to a higher level, we, we ask ourselves, why do businesses buy business interruption insurance in the first place? And the answer is to protect the revenue stream and to prevent the business from, from going under from a catastrophic or wide scale event. That's exactly why they buy it. And they, they don't buy it specifically because of fire or flood or wind. They buy these broad all risk policies to cover any event that results in an interruption, either total or partial of their business operations, unless that event is specifically excluded. And as we've seen, um, a, a good number of policies 
contain no exclusion whatsoever for virus or pandemic losses. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. Ryan, why don't you jump in on that and just talk to us a little bit about, you know, how these policies didn't really fathom something like this and how, you know, the market reacted once all of these claims came flooding in as they relate to sports and entertainment. Yeah, the, these are all, you know, poignant topics um, around the procurement of the appropriate insurance policies. Um, you know, Michael has used the term trigger, and in, in our terms, the triggers for different insurance policies uh, respond differently. So a lot of what we're talking about today is first party damage. So it often doesn't fall in the, in the realm of liability, which is a first party protection, but it's a third party cover. Uh, so traditionally business interruption claims have come from that property form. Um, cyber liability policies include it in their first party coverage. Um, but now we're getting to a point where directors and officers policies are having to respond because of the inappropriate management of uh, either the right policies or procedures. Um, and then the all important uh, event cancellation policy. So there's, there's a point in which when we're going through the underwriting process that we are our job really is to understand the operations of the business operator and then when procuring the right sorts of insurance policies is to manuscript them in a way to where the triggers are the broadest for the clients now what is so unique with covid was it wasn't our traditional triggers so an event cancellation policy the triggers were traditionally for things like utility disruption or power failure, um, non-appearance from the speaker or from the entertainer, um, uh, labor disputes, et cetera. Things that are somewhat quantifiable, yet um, we've gotten to a point now where the interpretation of these policies downstream of when we place them has opened up and become broader than the actual maybe intent of the underwriters. Underwriters, the job for them is to collect the appropriate premium for what they perceive the risk to be. The challenge when they were underwriting policies prior to COVID is they weren't pricing in the, uh, the, the, the large risk of, of what a pandemic could be. Um, so this evolution, as Michael has put it, early stage, we might have broader terms. If you've had an event that has been subsequent after very early 2020, there are new policy restrictions. So procuring policies now to cover ourselves for pandemic, for to cover ourselves against COVID is becoming much more difficult and much more costly as a result. So the, you know, I think there's kind of a, 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 a little bit of a subset in this is procuring the right limit of coverage. This has also been a detriment to a number of our clients where they've, they're able to relatively easily quantify what the loss of tickets sales have been, what the loss of merchandise sales have been, but that they undervalued the loss of reputational risk, the lack of sponsorship income, so that when now they're getting reimbursement for a BI claim or business interruption claim, they're not getting the right amount. They're they're you know they're they're coming up short in many cases. Um, I know we'll we'll kind of continue to transition um, down further in in the insurance and procurement process, but also the risk management. Um, Rich, anything else on this before we move along? Oh, I mean, that's really interesting, though, because I'm just thinking in real time about what you're saying about the loss of, um, you know, the reputational issue. That's really interesting, right? Because that's really hard to quantify. And what's everyone else seeing in terms of some of the exposure there and how to put a, a dollar value? I mean, that's really hard to do, right? But it's one of these sort of unspoken losses from COVID is to what degree is there reputational loss because of the lack of providing these services for over two years? I mean, Jason, in your space, Obviously, that's an issue. I mean, uh, you know, in the concert and, and live music space, 
a little different. I mean, last week in a podcast, we covered uh, business interruption claims as they relate to film and, and TV. At least those parts of the world were able to derive some revenue from still holding events, sporting events uh, also, for example. They were still holding NFL games, NBA games, even though there was no audience, they were still able to derive some revenue. Uh, in the concert space, you couldn't do that. You can't, you know, you weren't able to have events at all. So, you know, far different in, in, in your part of the world. Yeah, especially, you know, with the concert stuff, I mean, it shut down. There were some people that tried to do streaming things, but financially, you know, it was grains of sand on a beach compared to what a live show does. Um, the reputational damage probably affected the artists more so than the venues because like whether you call it Staples center or crypto.com arena you know it's there and the venues are for the most part still there we had to deal with sponsorship issues um where sponsors said hey we're paying a ton of money we're not getting anything and obviously like everyone you know no one wanted to write checks so it was extending things out um granting you know essentially putting a stay in their rights, and then we would tack on time to the back end or give them an extension. But I think what really was harmed, you know, there's a lot of artists who were working their way up through the business, and whether they were working as an opening act or working in clubs and theaters and then hoping to make the jump to arenas, you know, their careers just got completely interrupted. Um, and it's a creative process. So it's, you know, there's a few artists that did fantastic. Taylor Swift put out a few albums and said some other people. But for anyone who's, I guess, cl you know, climbing the ladder and working to build their career, that was a big step backward. And I don't know that they'll ever be compensated. Um, you know, and right now we're seeing a bunch of people going out trying to make up lost revenue. Um, and even for artists, who were able to work through it, the expenses have gone up significantly. Um, you know, ballpark of a half a million dollars on a stadium show. So those revenues, you know, someone's out touring, but they're going to come home with less money in their pocket. So there's definitely a hidden cost as a result of the interruption. That's really interesting. So, I mean, let's just jump on that for a second, because I think that's something you know, a lot of people aren't hearing too much what I certainly have. And I mean, are there, have you seen claims for reputational damage? And I mean, how do those look and how, how are, how are carriers and, and courts, if we've gotten to that part, how are they reacting? Yeah, I haven't seen any, I actually have not heard of any COVID related claims, period. Um, you know, initially we feared there would be a bunch, but you know, I think a lot of people talked about the fact that the plaintiff's attorneys and the folks that might go after someone because someone caught the disease, you know, they tend to go after things where they can show causation, which is really difficult. Um, and I don't know that there's insurance that just covers a bad situation when there's no, you know, it's a result, but COVID may be what caused it, but I don't know that, you know, anyone at those levels, um, especially, you know, performers, had any kind of disruption of that nature. Typically, we're thinking about, you know, illness, natural disasters, um, the stuff we all think about, you know, hurricanes, earthquakes, um, sleet, snow, hail, that type of thing. But I don't think, you know, there was coverage initially for a few people were able to cash in because the tours got stopped. Um, but I forget if it was Michael or Ryan said, you know, by March of 2020, those policies, you know, you could, the only reason you might have coverage was because you bought it, you know, 10 or 11 months earlier. Um, right. So, Mike, Ryan, you want to pick up on that? I mean, is there any risk in performers' talent alleging what Jason said, that their careers were interrupted because of COVID? I mean, what's that look like? Well, from my perspective, and Jason may have, uh, Ryan may have um, more granular detail from a from the broker standpoint, but it, it, the reputational harm issue um, is very difficult to to uh, to tag to insurance. I mean, it's a very amorphous concept. The valuation is difficult, but but even putting that aside, causation, as Jason said, is, is going to be a very 
difficult issue. The, the claims that we've seen in the entertainment space um, have focused more on lost revenue from canceled shows, whether it was caused by the pandemic or some other, other cause. And there have been quite a few claims uh, that have been brought under traditional property and business interruption insurance, as well as the event cancellation policies. For example, uh, Live Nation um, brought a claim under their commercial property and business interruption policy. Um, there were a number, and I don't have the names in front of me, uh, claims that were brought under uh, specific event cancellation policies. Some were specific to the canceled event. Others were uh, broader policies that covered the period of time, including um, the first year of the pandemic. And, and those claims were largely paid. Um, and they were paid because, and I'm talking about the event cancellation claims, they were paid because the policies included um, either communicable disease cover uh, that had been bought back. And I say bought back because the policy form that we were dealing with initially excluded that risk, but before the pandemic, it was relatively easy and, and a, a nominal cost to buy that coverage back. And the policyholder did. Um, when they went to renew that policy mid pandemic, there was no chance of getting the communicable disease cover in the renewal. Uh, we had one client whose uh, policy had been quoted, but not yet bound. Um, and the quote included substantial communicable disease uh, cover for the event cancellation policy. The carrier um, pulled back and said, we're not going to bind it, even though they had provided the, the quote, which was accepted. And that, that in and of itself became a dispute um, that had to be resolved. And, and they were able to reach a compromise. But there was a lot of pushback and a lot of quick pushback on the communicable disease cover. And this is something that's very different from, from what we would normally see where a risk starts to manifest itself, carriers start to pay out over time more money than they originally anticipated in the underwriting, and they eventually gradually pull back on the cover or reduce the limits or increase the premium. With pandemic and, and communicable disease in response to COVID-19, it was immediate and carriers could not act quickly enough to eliminate that coverage or substantially reduce it. Brian, anything to add on that before we jump on to uh, a related topic? Yeah, the, the, the way that we often provide some coverage around uh, reputational risk or reputational harm is less about the ability to quantify the loss of value uh, because to that point, it's very arbitrary and, and difficult to, to quantify. From a risk management perspective, though, it's more about having your insurance policy have a response for PR. So rather than USI having to communicate something or any of your firms having to be the ones that are communicating and putting out a you know something on the AP wire, it's a PR-driven process that hopefully softens the blow both to, you know, any stakeholder or uh, would be participant, uh, et, et cetera. So um, some of our policies and the better job that we do as brokers are manuscripting our policy, will have sublimits in the range of a million dollars for uh, for PR as a separate line item. So I wanna move on to another uh, area, that being weather in a moment, but, but, but maybe a good way to segue out of COVID is maybe each of you contribute your thoughts on you know what lessons we've learned as it relates to business interruption claims from COVID, uh, in how you're managing your business, how you're managing your risk, um, how you're transferring risk. Of course, is a huge topic that Simon referenced, and and Michael, how you're counseling your clients on how to deal with uh, similar claims going forward. I know that that covers a lot. I'm going to give you maybe like two minutes each before we jump into the weather piece. But Simon, you want to start with that? I mean, what? What lessons, what takeaways did you get from uh, some of the claims that, that we've seen as a result of COVID? Yeah, so one of the roles I have at Red Bull, in addition to being a risk manager, is I'm also a risk counsel. And so I spend a lot of time, sometimes more than half my day, working on contracting. And so some of the things that have come out of COVID in particular is that we went back and looked at all of our contracts, and not by choice necessarily, but because, uh, for example, uh, a lot of the venues and the entities that we were doing business with had uh, really 
bolstered their language around COVID and put all kinds of exclusions and limitations and whatnot. And so we had to look at it realistically, not just from a contracting risk transfer perspective, but also from a worker's comp perspective, uh, for example. Um, in, in instances where we had to send employees into somebody else's venue or an arena and they had required certain um, employees to sign waivers. And in, in some instances, typically workers' comp might have covered for that. Uh, but in other states where workers' comp did not cover COVID claims, I mean, California is one example where there was a presumption that if an employee got uh, COVID while in the course of employment, they were automatically presumptively covered under workers' comp under Gavin Newsom's uh, um, uh, legislation back in 2020. Uh, so we've started looking at contracts. The other thing when we talk about, we had a lot of different Red Bulls, a company that puts on hundreds of events. We do four or 500 events every year. Some of them are bigger brand building events. Some of them are smaller, what we call small fires, although that's probably not a good thing to call them. Um, but in a lot of our agreements, we had uh, certain force majeure clauses. And so we've gone back and looked at those closer. Um, and so we tried to, where they used to have things like curtailment of transportation facilities and government regulation as force majeure events, we started looking at pandemics and, and other types of things. And so we've, we've uh, improved some of the language in our contracts to be a little clearer to speak to those issues. But that's also dangerous because if you go in and you identify something like COVID-19, what about COVID-20 when it comes up next? So you want to talk about it in broader terms, but not so broad that it's sort of... Um, I guess, eliminates or, or dilutes the value of the language elsewhere. So those are some of the things that we've done, but con contracting is a big part of what we've done to, to address. And of course, when we do events now, uh, we're mindful of a whole lot more things. We obviously have to look at not only OSHA requirements, which, have, which at one point we're changing every week uh, to a different uh, safety things. And again, doing temperature checks when, when required and, and uh, making sure that, you know, even setting up tables or setting up areas in a bar or whatever else where we made sure that there were certain distances and things like that. These are all things that are top of mind now um, whenever we're involved with executing events. Um, but I would say contracting has been a big part of it as well. Thank you. Jason, what about you? How has COVID uh, affected the way you manage these things and, and approach uh, venues and, and events going forward? Um. It's evolved over time. I think what Simon said is totally correct. That, you know, initially, if whether it was waivers for fans or disclaimers on tickets, um, we had things like we didn't really want to open the venues right away. So we said, you know, if someone really wants to come in and host, say, a private event or to do a webcast, we said, you know, um, you need to affirmatively agree you're not, you know, you're taking the risk, you're assuming the risk. Um, we would, you know, affirmatively, we're not going to defend you for any claims related to COVID. Um, I think when we first started, you know, like everyone reevaluating our force majeure provisions, um, we had language in contracts that basically said, any government restriction related to COVID automatically, you know, it's forced for sure. Um, we can terminate the, we, the events terminated period. Over time we've evolved it because there's some restrictions that are okay. You know, it's a simple temperature check that shouldn't stop an event from happening. Um, capacity reductions, it depends how much they're reduced. Um, so we've, it's evolved to right now, we basically say if there's, you know, We've moved away from just responding to recommendations because we're seeing you know things are getting lifted. But if there's a government mandate or a restriction that adversely impacts the show, instead of saying it's automatically going to cancel, there's a lot of stuff we can work around. So we said we wanted to prompt a conversation, meet and confirm in good faith, and let's decide: is the event going to continue? Should it be postponed or rescheduled? Um, and if we completely cannot agree, then we'll say that's force majeure and we'll terminate. Because obviously the venue operators want their revenue. The artists need some revenue, but it doesn't work at 50% capacity. So if someone said, hey, you've got an 11,000 seat venue and you're allowed to do 10,000, we can probably find a way to make that work. So, yeah, we've sort of built some flexibility into the language by saying, restriction will prompt a conversation. 
Um, but I think the biggest thing I learned through this entire process, I used to wonder after 9-11, like, how'd they get all the airplanes down at once? Like, I used to think about them, like, what a challenge. And I realized the question I should have been asking for all those years was how'd they get them back up in the air and on schedule and get the aircraft to the right cities? Because I think March of 2020, when we shut down, that was a pretty simple process because it was obvious we couldn't do the events. But as we tried to plan for festivals and things to go up, knowing we might or might not have resurgences or there might or not, might not be restrictions or there might be restrictions no one anticipated, um, you know, working with the major talent agencies, it probably took us a solid year to get language that worked for both sides. So, yeah, it was a process um, a ton of communication and just, you know, everyone being able to understand the other side's perspective as we reopen the, build, the business. Yeah, uh, very interesting. Let's move on to uh, to weather-related claims because I do want to touch on those. Um, obviously, uh, you know, always uh, a factor as well when you're putting on live events. Uh, so Simon and Jason, maybe both could weigh in on this and we'll hear from Mike and Ryan as well. But, you know, listen, uh, now is festival season, at least in the Midwest, um, where we can only do these things a few times a year where I am. Uh, there's lots of great festivals coming up. How do you deal with a situation where you've got, you know, a big live event, um, you know, tens and thousands, tens of thousands of people, and one day might be great weather, and the next day the entire event might be affected by weather or some other force majeure. Uh, what does that look like in terms of your world? Simon, Jason, you want to weigh in on those? It gets tricky, um, you know, and it kind of depends how severe the weather event is and how long it lasts. Um, we've had some shows that open late because of weather, and that's, you know, other times it's an evacuation. Um, insurance comes into play. The prices have been going up because, you know, global warming is affecting things. Um, I don't remember the last time Lollapalooza just played straight through without any interruptions. Um, and with, you know, the fans, sometimes they want refunds, sometimes it's not that big. You know, I think there's a difference between if it rains from 2 to 6 p.m. and then a show resumes versus, you know, if it's 8 or 9 o'clock at night until midnight and you lose your headliners. So, again, it's a lot of conversations um, for the most part with the artists. You know, if we just skip part of a show or we put them on a different stage at a different time, there's usually not a problem. Um, and, you know, we're not going to take a windfall. So if we're not issuing refunds, the artists are going to get paid in full. If we start, if it's severe enough that we're issuing refunds to patrons, you know, that's probably when the insurance will kick in, but no one can really afford a big festival to cover 100%. So we tend to say, if you're off because of that severe of weather, you know, it's usually like a 50% deal, um, but it all varies. You know, again, it's conversations and building some breathability into the contracts because I think every force majeure is unique and fact specific. Yeah, Simon, your events are even a little more uh, dependent on the weather. You know, you can still listen to a performer at a concert, for example, in the rain. But I know some of your events are, you know, extreme sports traditionally, and you can't necessarily do those if the weather isn't uh, cooperating. Yeah, that's right. It, one of the things from Red Bull's perspective is we always put safety first, and we are all, always concerned about invitees. The unique situation that Red Bull is in that most of these events that we put on, whether they're the soapbox or the fluke dog, where we have people jumping off a 30 foot pier into a body of water and uh, entertaining all of us, is that they're not for profit. So there's not really a business interruption claim. We're a beverage company at the core, even though we have Formula One race teams and we have all kinds of crazy stunting activity that we do. None of these are really for profit. They really are more marketing that drives the, the core um, beverage business. And so for us, it's it's not like we're in the business of putting on events for profit. In fact, uh, I, I, I might even say that we lose money in every single one of those undertakings. Uh, but that said, we do put on bigger events from time to time. We're also, a lot of our events are derivative. We have a great partnership with AEG, for example, with Jason and and, and the likes of Live Nation and other sort of event producers all over the place. And, and 
oftentimes we're sort of the tail wagging the dog. So it's not as important for us. And we in fact don't buy a whole lot of uh, this cancellation insurance because it's really not, uh, again, for profit. And again, we try to put safety first and we'll cancel event, we'll call events all the time for weather and for various reasons, even though it doesn't make financial sense to do so because we wanna make sure that we're doing right by our, our uh, consumers. Mike, what are you seeing in the space and weather-related business interruption claims? Yeah, so it's broad, and I say that because depending on the nature of the interruption and uh, and what it has done to the business, what it has done to the venue, will implicate different insurance products. So you may have a weather event that renders uh, roads impassable. Um, the talent can't arrive, your guests can't arrive, um, and you have to cancel the show for that reason. That's going to implicate one type of insurance. That may implicate your event cancellation policy, which typically would cover the inability to conduct the event because of uh, travel, because uh, either patrons and or talent can't arrive. On the other hand, you may have a event cancellation, whether related because you, for example, you have a domed stadium um, and you have a concert event going on and the accumulation of snow on the roof causes the roof to collapse totally or partially. Can't conduct the event from safety reasons or the, the facility is just unusable. That's going to implicate your business interruption coverage most likely under your property insurance and traditional time element coverage, perhaps in addition to an event cancellation policy. It may also give rise to secondary liability under a general liability policy or a DNO policy. Um, gets away a little bit from the business interruption, but still is tied back to the weather-related event. And all of these things have to be assessed together to determine which policy, which um, source of indemnity is going to contribute, which will contribute first and in what amount. So, you know, weather can have a wide array of implications from an insurance perspective, and that ultimately leads to may lead to uh, claim disputes and litigation. Yeah, right. Yeah, go ahead, Jason. We had one where it was property claim damage because there was so much rain and mud that during loadout, you know, there were ruts from the production equipment going back and forth. And the question was, you know, is there coverage? And the property owner wanted to be made whole because, you know, once the mud dries, it had basically ruts in the middle of the field. And, you know, our risk manager and the insurance carrier spoke and they said ultimately it's property damage and there was no way around it. You know, so I think it requires, you know, conversations and some sometimes creative thinking, but you know, we've had coverage where you wouldn't think that just a truck driving across the field is gonna cause a problem, but it did, but we had to get the equipment out. Right, right. Ryan, uh Jason earlier mentioned uh, global warming, right? I mean, these issues are not subsiding. In fact, I'm sure a lot of you and our listeners saw the event in Yellowstone just this week where, you know, snow melting from the mountains resulted in these massive floods. It literally took a whole house off its, off its moorings and took it literally down the river. So these events aren't subsiding. What's your take on uh, what, what are some trends you're seeing, Ryan, in, in your part of it? Yeah, that, <clears throat> great point to bring up. Um, our insurance carriers have been using uh, risk management tools for years, many of them becoming automated, that have been able to uh, target uh, for those specific types of claims. So they model 100-year uh, flood events. Um, they model hurricane. They model for fire. Um, so these would be kind of our uh, large natural catastrophe coverages. They also model for earthquake. Um, what the, the trouble has been is that as either global warming or just the lack of uh, data going into these models uh, has shown that we are not appropriately pricing in, the insurance industry is not appropriately pricing in the volume or the frequency of said claims. Uh, brokers have begun to take it upon ourselves to also utilize the same systems our underwriters do. Because when a broker goes to an underwriter and says, we need terms for this, please give us your best rate. They come back with 
a number that they calculated, but how do we, as representative of, of our insured and yourselves, basically, how do we uh, agree with those terms? And is there a better process? So the process that we've started to do is we model for earthquake and flood, we model for wind, and to be able to, um, I think, help pick our client or help our client determine what they want to cover for their exposures, arbitrary of what underwriters want or how they're pricing their programs, so that we understand if I've got X number of properties, what is my total maximum value or, or PML, probable maximum loss, what is that amount, uh, and come up with insurance solutions that are based on your own exposures. Uh, as this continues to evolve, it's important to stay on that cutting edge. If you don't, when, when you have an opportunity to get together with your broker and work on how these policies all dovetail together, because as Michael put it, it really it, it transitions from your event cancellation policy over to your property and then back over to a secondary GL or DNO uh, pretty, pretty easily, but you want them to dovetail together in a way that benefits you. And if you, if your broker that is out in your, out in the marketplace for you does not understand your business as well as you do, then you need to engage with your broker at a higher, more important level, um, as well as then beginning to take on risk yourself. Like what, what amount of risk, if I've got a three day event, do I want to bear the burden for one day? Yes, but no, you're not for two and three. Um, hopefully that helps the answer. Yeah, very good. So with the 10 minutes or so we've got left, I want to jump into ransomware and, and you know, you can't make up this, uh, you can't make this stuff up. We talked earlier about how CERMA is here to provide you with cutting edge, uh, you know, content right out of today's headlines. And, you know, uh, three hours ago on Forbes.com, I'll use a very technical way of, of showing you this by holding up my cell phone. Here's the, here's the, uh, the headline. It says, why combating ransomware should top the list of insurance industry priorities? That's a 9 a.m. Uh, Eastern article. And it goes on to say, in just the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic, the FBI reported a 300% increase in cybercrime. Um, so obviously an issue, uh, obviously an issue for companies like yours, Jason and Simon, who are high profile, uh, prominent, deep-pocketed uh, potential targets in the sports and entertainment industry. Ryan and Mike, those are also uh, companies that you work with, that you represent. So why is this a particular issue that sports and entertainment companies need to worry about and how is the industry reacting to this growing risk? Anyone wanna jump in well, on that? I think I can give an overview that will probably surprise a lot of people. Because when I used to hear about cybercrime and ransomware, it's like, oh, someone sees the company's email account or you know, your banking information or something. For festival and events, like the amount of Wi-Fi and computer-related data that we use is incredible. The ticketing systems, you know, work off databases. Um, a lot of our festivals, we have RFID-enabled wristbands that we use for access control. And if someone seizes control, you know, and the scanners don't work, or everyone goes through, or no one goes through, or the ticket scanners don't work, and someone says, you need to pay me something or I'm not unlocking it. Um, it's getting people in and out of the event, something that basic, because um, it's not hard tickets anymore. And so, you know, I'll let the other guys talk about the insurance and some of the approaches, but we've had to do things like we hire a team basically of hackers to try and screw things up so that they can find our weaknesses and, you know, address them before they become a problem because, you know, we've got 125,000 people a day at Coachella, you know, that's a significant problem if it ever happens. But Jason, the bad guys are targeting events like Coachella yeah. for these attacks because they know that there's going to be this mass of people using Wi-Fi. Is that, is that correct? Yeah. Or, and like I said, the ticket scanners are the biggest concern, I think, for most of the venues, more so than, you know, like I said, historically, I think people just thought, oh, it's a corporate problem, not an event problem. Really interesting. Simon, what's your take on that?
Yeah, so from my perspective, a uh, couple of things. I think a lot of people focus when, when again, I, I talked a little bit about the contracting and dealing with various vendors. Uh, if you go back to sort of the three tenets of risk management, when we're hiring somebody that's involved with um, holding personally identifiable information or uh, having uh, whatever it is, a database or whatever it is that could potentially be uh, that give rise to privacy concerns and the like, we're really aggressive about doing the risk transfer contractually and holding them accountable. But I think insurance is a fix, of course, that it's great to be able to have insurance to respond when a loss happens, but that's not really how you manage this. Um, I mean, it, all it takes uh, in order to open the door to sort of the cyber liability or um, these types of claims is like, you know, one malicious email attachment or a weak password getting cracked. So I think it's really important that you're, you, you, you take the prophylactic measures up front and you've got to prepare uh, and, and understand that these are potential exposures. Uh, and of course, if organizations weren't giving into these ransomware demands, criminals would stop using the ransomware. But um, I found that cyber liability insurance premiums have gone through the roof. I don't know that the underwriters that underwrote it, you know, or started to underwrite this eight or 10 years ago, understood the exposures and the risks that were associated with it. And I have found that a lot of the people that we're doing business with now either can't afford it or just aren't buying it anymore. So this is a little bit of a concern, but I think ultimately, instead of trying to find a Band-Aid fix and having the insurance uh, to back up the, the exposure, it's, it's you've really got to focus on, and again, I'm not an IT guy, so I may not be speaking to this correctly, but you got to have the right encryption, you know, whatever it is, military grade, you got to prepare, you got to prevent, you got to detect, and when issues come up, you remediate, and of course, you've got to comply with laws, um, but also contractually, what we have found that if you have that kind of exposure, if you're carrying personally identifiable information or you're in a business that could potentially leave you vulnerable to these types of exposures, you try to try to put a limitation of liability in where uh, you, you put a super cap in your agreement, for example, where if it's a, if it's um, somebody else's uh, brute force attack and it's not your fault and you've done all the right things, that your liability might be uh, capped. At, at some whatever it might be two million dollars or five million dollars whatever the exposure is and so that's how we're dealing and that's how we're seeing it contractually where people are trying to limit uh their exposure um but it's not ideal one interesting thing that i learned a few years ago rims uh, had a program with lloyds of london and i spent a few hours with uh, with an expert uh that that spoke to ransomware and cyber attacks and one of the most interesting things that i heard is when these cyber criminals that are that are doing this, when you pay them off, they actually um, follow through and remove the, the ransomware, which is very interesting because they wanna make sure they have good customer service so the next time they come around and blackmail you that you'll, you'll, you'll pay. So it's really interesting that these guys have some sort of a moral code. code, apparently. That's an they interesting- They got codes, Simon. Yeah, exactly. They got all kinds of codes. <laughs> so talk, about, talk about reputational damage. They're concerned about their reputations in the dark web exactly. being armed if they don't follow through with their word. Ryan, let's uh, let's jump to you and then Mike. Well, we got only a couple minutes left for each of you, unfortunately. This is a topic that, of course, we could talk for hours about. Unfortunately, we only have a couple minutes left. But Ryan, what are you seeing in this space? Yeah, I'll just hit on a few points Simon made, but we'll confer those and then show a little bit of where the policies are going. So every day, our deductible requirements are becoming larger and larger. Premiums are going up at that same percentage. Rich, you said 300%. Our rates are up 100%, 200%, depending on the profile of the business. What we want to do so that you actually have good business interruption coverage is take it out from being a shared limit. So let's say you buy a $5 million BI or $5 million limit of cyber, have business interruption be its own standalone so that you're not eroding that limit when you're paying first party fixes and then third party defense for for you know PII or personally identifiable information getting out into the the ether um and then it's taking on more risk yourself so what Simon I think was saying too is buy a large deductible um you know really catastrophic coverage uh and and put some of that onus back on you what every carrier is requiring at least as of calendar year this year, is multi-factor authentication. If you don't have MFA, you're not going to get insurance or it's going to be disproportionately expensive. Interesting. Mike, last word on the subject. 
Yeah, yeah, and to, to echo the, uh, the independent business interruption limit, um, it, it's critically important in cyber because typically these policies have both the first party breach response coverage and the cyber liability coverage combined. And if you're, you're using your limits on one side, you're not gonna have it on the other. But it, it, to, to Simon's point, prevention is by far the, the best practice when it comes to cyber exposure. When we're talking about business interruption, it's gonna be that ransomware attack, that lockdown at the last minute before the show is about to start that's going to cause your massive disruption. Having a ransom policy in place that you know you can count on to pay that ransom, because as Simon said, these bad actors are not you know, bad when it comes to perpetuating their business. They will unlock that system, but you've gotta make the payment and you gotta make it quick. The show must go on, right? So. You've got to be prepared to act. And that, that gets to the broader picture. When you're dealing with any cyber prevention and having that plan is critical because in every jurisdiction, timing is critically important. You must act immediately. When you are notified of a breach, particularly of PII and third party information, you have got to notify authorities, you have got to notify the FBI, and you've got to be on it immediately. You cannot start to put together your plan after the breach occurs. You've got to have it ready and doing tabletop exercises, working with a cyber professional before the breach occurs is fundamental to making sure that that happens when it happens. Because as we say, it's not a matter of if, but when. You may think that your systems are, in, are not vulnerable. They are vulnerable and it's going to happen at some point. The best protection is to be ready for it. Wow, excellent stuff. That hour flew by. Uh, I want to suggest that we continue this discussion at the fluke tag that Simon, uh, I heard him invite us to the uh, the next Red Bull fluke tag. For those of you that don't know what the fluke tag is, it's a competition where regular people put together what? Uh, human powered flight machines? Is that an accurate assessment, uh, Simon? So maybe That's we can right. continue this discussion in a, in a group, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, power, human powered flying machine and at the next fluke tag. What do you think, fellas? I'll be happy to push, uh, <laughs> but I'm not getting in on one of those. <laughs> uh, as I said, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback on today's presentation, what you like, what you didn't like, what you'd like to hear in the future. Uh, special yeah. thanks to our behind the scenes staff for helping us out today, especially Yvonne Barbosa. We'd love you to join yeah. the organization. I passed over that. Uh, it takes literally about three or four minutes. It's uh, at our website, thesurma.org, join the CIRMA yeah. page. And especially a huge thank you to the incredible contributions of our dream team, Jason Bernstein from AEG Presents, Ryan Douglas from USI Insurance Services, Simon Kashishian from Red Bull, and of course, Michael Levine with Hunt and Andrews uh, Kurth. Thank you all so much, really appreciate it. Thank you to all our viewers, and we'll see you next time uh, with our next Thermo webinar. Yeah.